اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم all praise belongs to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting you and i this existence and for granting us the opportunity to continue these weekly shows here on enlight media we want to welcome you all to our thursday night program elevated spirits and inshallah tonight as you know marks the 11th of dhul qa'da in the islamic calendar which coincides with the birth of our eighth holy imam imam ali ibn musa rida alayhi salam so we want to congratulate you all on the birth of this great personality and inshallah in tonight's discussion we want to dissect the life of this great imam and discuss many of his qualities and the legacy that he has left behind for you and i to follow so inshallah as always in order to begin our thursday night program i'll hand it off to brother hasanain to make some introductory comments and then inshallah we will continue the discussion from there on a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salam ala khairi khalqi wa nuri arsh afdal al anbiya wal mursalin habibina wa sayyidina wa sanadina wa shafi'ina wa maulana abi al qasim muhammad wa ala alihi al tayyibin al tahirin al ma'sumin al madlumin I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful, and all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we thank Him for granting us great leaders, leaders that we can look up to so that we can emulate and follow them and use them as our role models, not only to become greater people, but also to understand the dynamics of how life should actually work. For indeed, when we have difficulties and trials, we think that it's a loss and it's going backwards and regression, but in fact, when we look at the examples of our imams and the prophets, you find that it appeared that they were regressing due to the oppression of tyrants and evildoers, when in fact they used it towards the benefit and the advantage of uh, promotion of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tonight I would like to first and foremost congratulate the human race on the birth of our, our eighth imam, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim alayhi salatu wasalam. He's known as... Uh, Imam Rida, you know, Radi bil Qadari wal Qada, the one who was satisfied with the decree of, of God and, of course, with whatever came in his own abilities. Tonight, I'd like to actually stress, and inshallah, we will be joined with the panel with Brother Muhammad Jafar and Brother Amil, uh, and we will discuss the dynamics. As you know, this weekend we are going to be spending time uh, on uh, celebrating the great gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in terms of the legacy of Imam Radha alayhi salam. And Imam Radha is a very unique uh, figure among the 12 Imams because he was the one who was taken away from Arabia into the land of the Persians. As you know, he was taken to Mar by Ma'mun, who was the caliph of the time. Uh, as you know, he succeeded his father, Harun al-Rashid. And Ma'mun is a very interesting character. And you find that the history of all these um, caliphs who came later on in time, even in the early ages of the early ages of the Umayyad Empire, you will find that they were very political, they were very manipulative, and they were doing everything to basically establish their own will and greed uh, as the status quo norm for humanity. Uh, Muawiyah was a great example of an individual who worked very hard to eradicate uh, the power of Islam eradicate the truth and to replace it with his lies. And you find that the Imams were constantly uh, in their pathways. And these caliphs knew that these Imams were their only hurdle uh, that prevented them from essentially destroying humanity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us by granting us leaders that are not only great role models, but they were in, entrenched in the details of the, uh, the socio-economic political growth of humanity. And our Imams and Prophets ensured that humanity would not fall uh, in the hands of these kinds of tyrants. And the best example, Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala, of course, uh, he was the Skyan that left a huge uh, system forward for us to use by which never to lose hope uh, in the future and the growth of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Radha's history is very interesting because, as you know, the Imams 
just like our sixth Imam when we were celebrating his legacy last week, is the fact that regardless of whether they were given opportunities or they were subjected to tyranny, such as incarceration, we find that they were constantly finding ways and means by which to promote the ways of Allah. And Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munka wa tu'minuna billah. You are the best in the community, you promote good, you forbid evil, you believe in Allah. Allah is addressing here specifically to his appointees, but of course he's addressing the whole human race, that if you come up to the plate, to the way the prophets and the imams are, or you follow in their footpath, then maybe you will be considered kuntum uh, khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. But there's a condition for ukhrijat linnas that you and I have to completely submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, our imams, you notice Imam Jafar Sadiq السلام, had the opportunity that the Umayyad Caliphate was collapsing, the Abbasid Caliphate was taking over. As you know, Mamun and Harun Rashid were part of the Abbasid Caliphate, and they were busy grabbing power. And interestingly, they, while they were grabbing power, they were using the, the principles of Ahlul Bayt as the foundation for why they should be where they are. Look how ironic it is that the very members of Ahlul Bayt, who are the agents of God, are present in their domain, they're just ignoring them, but using them as validation for their own usurpation of rights that didn't belong to them. And Imam Rida, as you know, was pulled from Medina to Mar, and it was, as he, Imam Rida is known as Gharib al Ghuraba, meaning he's a stranger among strangers. It's very fascinating when we study this that Imam Rida as was brought into a land that had just recently become Muslim. As you know, the Persians were known to be pagans before, and alhamdulillah, the impact of Islam upon them was huge. In fact, in time, because of Imam Rada salam, and then of course the Safavid Empire that came, you will find that the power of love of Ahlul Bayt has created this you know, massive population, 95% of the Islamic Republic today, being followers of Ahlul Bayt, followers of the Ja'afari school of thought. That is not by accident. That is by decree by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the effects of that decree is predicated on Imam Radha's very strategic moves. The strategic moves of our Imams, all of them, to ensure that wherever they go, that they would put light upon people. As Allah says, Nurun ala nur yahdi Allahu li nurihi man yasha wa yadrib Allahu al-amthala linnas. Light upon light. And he... he guides to that light who he wills. Our Imams were definitely light upon light. And when they approached even distant lands, they say that when Imam Rada salam, entered Persia, you find the local people were so attracted to him. He was such a magnetic figure that they just couldn't stop loving him. And he was using that so effectively by which to bring people to the truth. And Mamun, who was using Imam Rada in order to sort of get public support against his brother Amin, who he eventually killed. Look at the irony, two brothers fighting for power, using the caliphate as the seat by which to play their little games. And what is this caliphate? It's all under the garb of this uh, khilafah, under the, under the garb of deen of God. Look at, look at how shaitan works. When he says to us, to Allah, that he is going to obfuscate the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh my God, you're seeing it. You're seeing the, the devil himself sitting on the seat of the throne and claiming to be the representative of God. And imagine our imams, the difficulty they had to face because he was very, very um, sensitive. And they were hiding under the garb like chameleons, one minute claiming to be representative of God, of, of God the way the emperors preceded who claimed to be right under God and they were the voice and the hand of God. If you look at the emperorship of many, many nations, people consider them gods, in fact. So here is a caliphate that was never presented by the Holy Prophet. It was never given credence, but it was fabricated and created under, under the Umayyad Empire. And Muawiyah was the founder of this insanity. And Imam Radha now has to deal with this in a strategic way that he would have to now get rid of the bathwater without killing the baby. It's a very surgical approach. And I would like for us to discuss this. And you will see that his generosity, his wisdom, his kindness, and his exposure to the public was so fine-tuned that people understood where truth lied, 
in where falsehood lied, though they were both looking at the Imam and Mamun as the caliph of the time. People understood the difference. And I think that's very important for us to understand. And the Imam was very strategic about it to such an extent that he started gaining popularity. That when he was pulled over, Mamun had a dream to eventually kill Imam Radha alayhi salam and to bury him under the foot of his father, Harun al-Rashid. Imam Radha alayhi salam says to one of his companions, he says, this Mamun wants me to be buried under his father's foot, but it's not going to happen. He's not going to succeed. The reason is because his desire is not within the desire of God. And Allah says, wa makaru wa makar Allah. Wallahu khairul makirin. They plan, God plans. God is the best of planners. And so, so true. But the interesting thing is that Imam Radha alayhi salam, just like Yusuf alayhi salam when he was incarcerated in prison, or even when he was in Egypt, taken away from his father, uh, you'll find that he was instrumental in bringing Islam to Egypt, okay, to the Egypt of that time, to such an extent that he even made the king of the time a Muslim. Akhnatun became a believer. And this is the message you and I need to follow, that while Thursday night is a very spiritual night, that when we listen to Dua Kumail, we're asking God for, for, for forgiveness. We're asking God for protection. No question about it. But what is it all of this for? It's all so that you and I become instrumental, not only to save our souls on the Day of Judgment and to take us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards success, but those around us who get affected by what we do and what we don't do is an integral part of our deen. So you and I cannot say that I'm going to shut my door and I'm just going to worship God privately. No, you and I are going to be instrumental. And inshallah, we will discuss that further. Uh, we'll, I'll hand this over to Brother Ahmed, inshallah. When we discuss of Imam Rida alayhi salam, there's so much to discuss uh, about this holy personality. But truly, anytime we discuss the legacy of any of our blessed holy Imams, the core thing that really comes to mind when we discuss their legacy was the fact that each and every single Imam took us back to the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the pure teachings of Islam. This was the core message of every single Imam. If you look at every single Imam that we've had, what they did, their aim was to be mirror reflections and mirror images of the Holy Prophet This is what they did. They took us back to the pure teachings of the Holy Prophet. They did not come with any of their own concocted ideologies or their own concocted ideas and their own concocted revelation, trying to preach something new and trying to introduce innovations into the religion of Islam. This was not their goal at all. Their goal was to continue the message of the Holy Prophet and to continue to teach us the pure message of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the Quran. And that's why the Holy Prophet told us, that I am leaving behind two weighty things. My book, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kitabullah, the book of God, and the following of my Ahlul Bayt. Ma in tamasaktum bihima lan tadillu ba'di abada. If you do not, if you hold on to these, you will never go astray, the Holy Prophet ﷺ. But you find you and I, as Muslims, unfortunately, in the various sects that we have in the religion of Islam, we are masters of picking and choosing that, oh, I'll take the Quran, but I don't need the Ahlul Bayt. Oh, I'll take the Ahlul Bayt and I'll recite so much poetry about them, but I have no idea about the principles of the Quran. This is not proper. The core is Kitabullah, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the following of the Ahlul Bayt. So you find every single Imam, including Imam al-Radha they were the mirror images of the Holy Prophet. They reflected the message of the Holy Prophet. And that's why the Holy Prophet himself stated, Awaluna Muhammad, wa awsatuna Muhammad, wa akhiruna Muhammad, wa kulluna Muhammad. That the first of us is Muhammad, the middle one is Muhammad, the end is Muhammad, and all of us in fact, in reality, or Muhammad, wa kulluna Muhammad, because they all resonated the same message of the Blessed Prophet, and they brought us back to the pure teachings of the Holy Prophet. In fact, even if you look at Imam Ali, you find when Imam Ali was not caliph 
in the the in the physical sense of course we know he was of course always the khalifa of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when his right at a political level was taken away from him you find many things about the way the prophet did things were changed and that's why when imam ali alayhi finally came back to khilafa you find when he first led prayers the companions of the prophet that prayed behind him exclaimed that the salati muhammad that today you reminded us of the way the holy prophet prayed meaning what if someone is making such a statement it is implying clearly that the way even the way in which the prophet prayed was changed after the death of the prophet and this is what the imams did they brought us back to the pure teachings of the holy prophet and the imam al-sadiq whom we just commemorated a few weeks ago as you know imam al-sadiq passed away in 148 years after hijra the same year in which uh, Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam was born. In fact, Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam was born just approximately one month after the passing of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. And Imam al-Ridha was the same principle as Imam al-Sadiq. In fact, Imam al-Ridha, quite similar to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, had a unique opportunity to spread the knowledge of the religion of Islam and the pure teachings of the Holy Prophet because of the fact that the Caliph of the time, Ma'mun, made him the crown prince, right? The heir apparent. And hence, he was able to spread the religion of Islam at a national level because he was made the successor. He was declared the successor. And of course, this was done as a political move and he was going to be used as a pawn by Ma'mun. But nonetheless, this position of power at the government level gave the Imam an opportunity to spread the religion of Islam and to bring the people back to the pure teachings of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And that's why one of the names, one of the titles that is given to Imam al-Ridha is the Alim Ali Muhammad, that the learned of the family of the Prophet, because he had this unique opportunity to spread Islam and the teachings of the Prophet at a national level by being given that stamp of the crown prince by Ma'mun. And you find, even if you, if you look at the, this, the Salat al-Eid, you find when the way the Prophet prayed Salat al-Eid during the time between the Prophet's death and up to the time of Imam al it had changed. People were not performing it in the same manner. And that's why you find when Ma'mun, one day he asked Imam al I want you to go and lead Salat al-Eid. I want you to lead the prayer of Eid. Imam al says, no problem. Of course, at first he, he, did, he, he resisted because he knew Ma'mun was making this a political game and he wanted to use him. So he first he resisted, but eventually he acquiesced and says, okay, I'll go and lead Salat al-Eid. And when he went to lead Salat al-Eid, they say that the Imam came out barefoot, wearing white gear, wearing a white headgear, completely white, and walked barefoot. And he was walking to lead Salat al-Eid and he encouraged everyone around him to follow because this was the way the Holy Prophet used to pray. And they began to walk and many thousands of thousands of people, they say, joined the Imam and they were reciting loud takbirat. Loud takbirat. And in fact, this news reached Ma'mun that in fact, Imam al there are thousands and thousands of people following him and they are chanting. And you know, Ma'mun became a bit paranoid because he said, you know, these people can now take advantage of the situation and now can uprise and overthrow me. So the Imam was eventually stopped from leading Salat al by Ma'mun. But the point was the Imam introduced and was constantly bringing us back to the way that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu did things. So the one thing I want to emphasize is Imam al just like Imam al-Sadiq, just like every other Imam, they were mirror images of the Holy Prophet and their main objective was to continue and to show us the true teachings of the Holy Prophet and they reflected the teachings of the Holy Prophet and this was really the core aspect of all of their legacies. And of course there's so much more to discuss about the legacy of this great Imam, but inshallah in order to continue, I'll ask Brother Muhammad Jafar, who, as you know, is joining us from, from Canada, Canada today, today. So to join us, us and inshallah, inshallah make some comments. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. How are you? Alaikum assalam. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I actually love everybody if we can recite Surah Fatiha for Zuhair Hussein's dad, who mm -hmm. died 40 days ago. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. He's one of our panelists and our Quran reciters, and today is special because it is Thursday. It is such a beautiful time because we, as followers of Ahl al-Bayt, we know and we've heard and we've learned about the greatness of Imam Rida. However, the world hasn't, and it's sad because these were the leaders of the earth to teach humanity to love God, to guide humanity back to God. What did the Prophet do? Guided humanity to God, to love Him in this religion of love. Now there's a 
few very good points you guys made, and I, I actually will add to it, but before we do, we're living in a strange time in the world, okay. as you can see with COVID, you can see with collapse of businesses and bankruptcies, and it's a time where people don't know what's the priority. The business that they love now is gone. So there's a few very good ayats I'll mention in Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman in Surah Fajr, verse 20, 21, 22. And you love wealth, with immense wealth. And this is the time we're in. People and all of us have fallen in love with the wrong God. In gold we trust, or in God we trust, right? That's the dilemma. Second, Allah continues when he says, and when the earth shall be leveled and pounded and crushed, then and your Lord and the angels will come. So the judgment is coming. The, the end of times is close. We don't know when. But we have to always prepare our lives to go back to God, to love God. The day of judgment is a constant reminder for us to do good on this earth. And these bankruptcies and these crazy things that are happening constantly are showing us, wait a second, this time is over, your time is over, but we don't even know who our imams are. Is there our imam in, in the east or the west? Is it in the White House or is it where, right? Because if that's our imam, we're in trouble. But Allah says he will raise us with our imam of our time. And then if you look at the teachings of the Prophet, he said there will be 12 after me. It's in Sahih Bukhari, it's in Sahih Muslim. So that's not the issue for us. The issue for us is Allah has already promised that He will put someone on this earth. Every nation had an apostle. Chapter 10, verse 47. And certainly we will raise in every nation an apostle. So the time of Imam Rada was Imam Ali al Musa ibn Rada. So it's beautiful. Some people didn't accept him. Inshallah, later I'll talk about something that you know we've talked about before, that they didn't accept his son because of the color of his skin. But is it about personalities? Because Brother Hassan has always done a very beautiful speech. It's not about personality, it's about principles. And he's given this beautiful story about the Battle of Nahrawan, when Imam Ali al Islam was confronted by the enemy. And the enemy basically lost his sword. And the enemy says, Well, we've heard that you're so amazing that if you, someone asks you for anything, you'll give it to them. He says, Sure. He says, Give me your sword. Imam Ali gives him the sword. And he says, No, I can kill you now. He says, No, I don't think so. It's, it's up to Allah, it's not up to you. And the man says, you know, wow, I want to follow you. I like you. And Imam Ali, of course, says, friend, follow truth and justice. Follow principles and not persons. But where does that come to us as followers of Ahlul Bayt? Why do we follow these personalities? Because they are the image of the Quran, the teachings of God in this world. They are the principles. They're not just some personality that we like the way he looks or smells or eats. No, it's not about that. Chapter 2, verse 30, I know the surah is about when the angels were asked, with Kala Rabbukal Malaikati inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. Allah has said, I am going to put a successive authority on this earth. And Shaitan says, I don't want to go through Adam. Allah tells all the angels and Iblis, as some people call Lucifer, to bow down to Adam. And they said, wait a second. No, no. This doesn't make sense. The angels, of course, got their answer, as we know that. They were shown that you don't have the knowledge. But Iblis says, look, I want to go straight to you, God. Forget personalities. I want you, God. But Allah says, you want me? You got to go through Adam. If you want to follow me, bow down to Adam. But Iblis only looked at the outside. He didn't look deeper and didn't follow Allah. So we're living in a time that there's a lot of things happening and we need guidance. And Imam Rida was that fountainhead. As you were saying, Amal, that his knowledge, because of his letters to Mamun, because of his debates, spread on this earth. And we do have so much of the science we have today because of the Imam's teachings. And their teachings were to share for all of mankind, to help all of mankind. So thank you for inviting me, and I'm just here to help you guys, you know, in this Thursday panel. Thank you, thank Mother you Mother Muhammad, for your, your introduction. introduction. You, know, you know, we talk, talk about, about the legacy, legacy of Imam Allah. Uh, uh, there's, there's so, so much, much to mention, mention and there's so much to discuss. But you find one thing that you just mentioned, I want to harp back on, where you mentioned the story of Adam and Satan and how Satan refused to bow to Adam and told God, Allah, I only want to worship you. I don't want to go through the Khalifa that you have put on the earth. I want to get a direct line to you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, 
He didn't, he didn't congratulate uh, Satan says, oh, you have the best Tawheed. You have pure Tawheed. You must worship me. You got it. You passed the exam. He says, no, you must worship my Khalifa and representative that I put on this earth. And the reason I this point is so important is because you find within in the story of Imam Ridha, alayhi salam, as you know, as we mentioned, Imam al Ridha was forced to migrate from Medina to the area of Marv where Ma'mun was. And this was during the last two or three years of his life. And you find on this journey, when Imam al was traveling from Medina to, to Marv, he stopped in various cities along the way because this was a very long journey. And in every city that he used to stop in, he used to spread you know, the message of the Holy Prophet and people would get to meet the Imam for the first time, right? Many of these individuals had never even seen the Imam. They had never met the Imam. So the Imam, when he was continuing on this journey, was able to spread the teachings of the Holy Prophet while he was on this journey. And you find one of the cities that the Imam stopped in was the city of Neshabur in Iran. And one of this was a city where he stopped and we have a famous hadith of the Imam alayhi salam where it relates to the, the, the story of Iblis and Shaitan because the Imam introduces a very fundamental point. He stopped at Neshabur and they say that there were thousands of narrators of hadith there waiting to listen to what the Imam would say. Thousands of narrators of hadith because you know Neshabur at that time was an area, was a city where there was lots of scholars, lots of universities, lots of spreading of education. So the Imam stopped in this area to, to stop and rest and the people surrounded him and they wanted to hear from the Imam because they had not heard from him. They wanted to hear him speak. And the Imam got on the pulpit and he, and he narrated what's known as the golden chain, the silsila to dhahab, the golden chain of hadith, where he says that my father told me from his father, from his father, and this chain went all the way back to the Holy Prophet. And the Holy Prophet said, I heard this from Jibra'il, who narrates directly from God himself. So hadith al-Qudsi, with a golden chain of narrators, all the narrators from Jibra'il, from the Holy Prophet onwards, are all infallible imams. And the hadith was very simple. What was this hadith that Imam al ridha introduced? He mentioned that hadith al-Qudsi that Jibra'il said, I heard from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the testimony of la ilaha illallah, there's no deity but God, is my fortress. And whoever enters this fortress is secured from my chastisement. This was this golden hadith that the, that the Imam narrated. That the, the statement of la ilaha illallah, meaning pure tawheed, the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the pure fortress and whoever enters this pure fortress, meaning you have pure Tawheed, you are secure from the chastisement. But the Imam didn't stop there. He quotes this hadith, they say he sits back down, but then he gets back up and he says one more statement to complete this, this narration of hadith. And he says, but there are conditions and I am one of those conditions. Meaning the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, the Imam was introducing them as being the representatives of God is a key component of this statement of Tawheed because it is through the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, through the Holy Prophet that we get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the ones who have the highest knowledge of God and they are the ones who bring us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through their knowledge. So this was a profound statement the Imam says, it's not just sufficient to have pure Tawheed or to say, I believe in God, because if we're using that logic that, oh, belief in God is sufficient, then the likes of Yazid, Muawiyah, Marwan ibn Hakam, any Joe Shmo that is a tyrant ruler can say, oh, I have Tawheed. I am in the fortress of God and I am secured from chastisement. By that logic, then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ladina amanu Allah wa atiyu rasoola ulil amri minkum, if we're to say any individual is the ulil amri minkum, any individual, then we're to say that anyone can say, oh, MBS today is ulil amri minkum and we must follow him. But the Imam says, no. We, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, are the condition for this La ilaha illallah, to be protected from this chastisement because it is through you, through us that you get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way He was supposed to be known. And I think that's an important part that we need to discuss and, and emphasize that the wilaya of the Imams, the Holy Prophet, these are central figures that take us to the Holy, to the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you and I cannot differentiate. And Allah, and Allah says in the Quran, Allah says those individuals who like to differentiate between God and His Messenger say, oh, we'll believe in this or we'll believe in God, but we won't believe in the Messenger. We believe in the Messenger, but we won't believe in God. You do this, Allah says, You are the, the real disbelievers. You cannot differentiate. The Imams of the Ahl Bayt, the representatives of God, are core 
are core to the religion of Islam. And I think that's a very, very fundamental point to mention. And there's so much to discuss about this legacy of this holy Imam. I mean, so many aspects we can talk about. And the beautiful aspect really of Imam al-Rida or any of the Imams is you find all of them exuded all the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to the perfect manifestation as could be possible on this earth. Whether it be the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, so many various attributes, mercy, forgiveness, charity, generosity, all of these various components, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, they manifested it beautifully. I mean, we have so many countless stories of the Imams, how they were generous, how they gave in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how they guarded people, and they did not want anything in reward. As they say, لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا, that we don't want any reward or thanks from you. We're not doing this for money. We're not doing this for fame. We're not doing this to bring our family name up. No. In fact, the Holy Prophet himself said, when he says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ That I don't want anything from you except that you love my Ahlul Bayt. It's not because, oh, I want you to remember my family so my family name can spread across the earth. He says, no. قُلْ مَا سَأَلْتُكُمْ مِنْ أَجْرٍ فَهُوَ لَكُمْ Whatever I ask you, it is for your own benefit. And inshallah, we can take these lessons from Imam al and these various Imams on how to apply them into our own lives because the practical aspect is the most important. We can talk about the Imams and we can celebrate them and, and it's important. We must remember because Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى Remind them for reminders beneficial. So we must remind, but that reminder must be accompany, accompanied with practice. Inshallah, Brother Sinan, you can you can add on to that. Yeah, thank you, Brother. Um, Actually, there was a question that was asked with regards to uh, pagan worship. Uh, I think we should address that too. I mentioned that. You notice that uh, Quran in Surah Rum, Allah says, غُلِبَتِ الرُّومِ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَمِنْ بَعْدِ مِنْ غَلَبِ سَيَغْلِبُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, brings a verse where if you know history, you will see that the Persians were the nemesis towards the Romans. And the Romans used to fight the Persians. And Persians were known to be the pagans. They were the idol worshippers. And then the, the Romans were known to be the monotheists. And the Arabs of the time in Mecca were actually taunting the prophet that, look, your God is not strong. In fact, you see, uh, the, the, the worshippers of idols are actually superior. And Allah promises that soon they will be defeated and the Romans will uh, succeed again. And I want us to understand that, you know, we had... Uh, uh, kings and the prophets sent messages to when he declared his prophethood in public. And as you know, he sent it to, uh, to Khusro Parvez and he sends him the letter. And Khusro Parvez was not a believer in God. He was an idol worshiper. And in fact, he was incensed when, when the prophet said, I begin in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. So I think it's important for us to also know the history that sure, in every nation, there were believers of one God. In every nation, there were worshipers of one God. But uh, Persia was certainly not known to be a monotheistic uh, society in, in its original history. So, I, I, you know, I, with all due respect to the Persian history, uh, let's not uh, let's not overextend something that, uh, because of its strength today, mashallah, and what Persia represents today on Earth, by far to me is the flag on many fronts when it comes to fighting for justice, fighting for unity, fighting for decency. Subhanallah, you know, I mean, what more can we say? But let's be factual about our history so that we are not uh, fooled into thinking of something that was perpetual. Even Salman, as you know, his name was Ruzbe. He escaped his father who was a fire worshiper, right? Uh, and Salman actually was going to be killed by his father on that basis. So we need to understand our history. Imam Radha salam, played a very critical role in bringing spirituality to those people. Uh, just like, um, you know, when Imam Ali salam, moved to Kufa, uh, when he moved the, the, uh, the caliphate position, meaning the, the uh, capital, to Kufa, it was more strategic because of the expansion that happened in the first, especially in the second caliph's time. And it's important for us to know that these were strategic moves based on political scenarios of the time. And regardless of what the politicians did at the time, our imams made sure that first and foremost, as Brother Amal mentioned, Brother Muhammad mentioned, that belief in Allah, the oneness of Allah, the purity of God, all of these factors were central to the establishment of the system of God. It wasn't about politics. It wasn't about 
pushing or promoting one person over another. It was about Tawheed, the purity of Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved Ibrahim and calls him Khalilullah. He calls him the friend of God. Why? Because in his era, there was nobody. Even later on, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam became the, the, the role model template by which to follow in Islam. Right? Millata abikum Ibrahim. And uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, his system was the Islam. And so we need to understand that. So historically moving forward, and Brother Muhammad, you can just jump in also. And uh, uh, I think you're getting a feedback when you turn on your mic. I don't know for some odd reason. Uh, but what we, we need to understand, what were the roles Imam Radha alayhi salam played? Uh, yeah, Brother Muhammad, I think I'm getting feedback. Okay. Yeah, that's so. Uh, you know what the brother Amil, you can jump into in terms of the um, the role that Imam played specifically. Now, Mamun was using Imam Rada for his political whims, right? Very clearly. So Mamun was trying to use Imam Rada uh, as a means by which to galvanize people in his direction. I want us to pay attention by the very fact that here's a caliph of the time declaring himself as a caliph, and he was a false caliph, obviously, but you find himself realizing where the truth lies because he's now aiming towards that which he wants credibility for. It's very important for us to understand that when a person claims to be the representative of God as a caliph, why would you need Imam Radha? Why don't you just you know, take the, the name of Allah and just establish yourself? Imam Radha salam beautifully answers this question. When Mamun sees him in Maru, and Mamun now publicly declares, uh, you know, uh, publicly declares that, yeah. you know, yeah. that you are now the successor to the, to the to, you know, I want to give up this caliphate. Imam Radha answers beautifully. Number one, he says, when God gives you this position, listen to the answer of the wisdom of our imams, which we need to take as a lesson. When God gives you this position of caliphate, you cannot give it up. You cannot say, okay, I'm no longer the caliph today. Because if it's a divine gift of God, you cannot take, you cannot say, Imam Ali Alayhi doesn't wake up one morning and say to Allah, I'm no longer your, you know, your khalifa that you chose. I'm no longer the successor to the prophet. I've decided I don't want to be. You, you don't. When Allah declares that you are the representative of God, you don't wake up one morning and just say, okay, you know what? Today I want to hand over my, my imama to X, Y, Z. You can't do that. Mamun was doing that, number one. Okay, to show you the falsities of Mamun, number one. Number two, he says, well, you know, I've decided that you are more qualified to be the successor. This was a trick, of course, in trying to convince the people that, look, he's, he's with the Ahl al-Bayt. It, it was a trick. But look how the Imam replies. The Imam looks at him and says, well, uh, first and foremost, uh, you don't have the right to give it to me. Number two, since you are willing to give it and you know it, God didn't give it to you, why are you sitting on it? Give it up. Give up that position. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. Look at the Imam. Imam wasn't excited because of the fact that, you know, he's giving me this caliphate. Even the companions of Imam Radha alayhi salam became excited that, oh, finally, finally, finally. somebody is going to recognize, uh, you know, somebody is going to recognize. No, no. Imam Radha alayhi salam was not fooled by it. So please bear in mind that leadership and for us to follow to get closer to Allah demands a certain quality. We cannot have leaders who are murderers, who are liars, who are cheaters, who are thieves. Those cannot be our leaders of the future or of the present. It's impossible. We cannot accept them. We have to validate our leadership so that when we do pray to Allah, and when Allah says, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ The path of those you have chosen. Every one of us on earth should ask Allah, which ones have you chosen? So this historical reference where we are commemorating, uh, you know, and we're celebrating, of course, here, Imam Radha, or when we commemorate both, these become a means by which we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think it's very important for us to, uh, to, to bear in mind. So number one is Imam Radha alayhi salam refuses. Mamun forces him to take this position, forces him. Imam Radha on many occasions tells him, no, I am not willing to accept this. I will not accept this. Because Imam knew that Mamun is using him as a, as a tool by which to promote his own agenda. 
But in the process, as Brother Amil mentioned, in the process, he said, okay, you're going to force me on this. I'm going to follow the way of Allah and his prophet. Just to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam, khilafa, when he was usurped, he was offered, okay? He was offered by, as you know, the second caliph established six people. Six people by which to uh, to decree who the, uh, the the fourth caliph should be, the third caliph should be, the third, the one who was going to uh, come after Omar bin Khattab. And they offered it to Imam Ali alayhi salam. You know what the condition of the offering was? That you, we will appoint you as the Khalifa on the following condition. That you also accept the legitimacy of the first two. Now notice Imam Ali alayhi salam could have said, listen, I will accept it. It's fine. What's the difference? I'm still the, the representative of God. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, no. I will obey only Allah, the messenger, and myself. Nobody else. And if you are not willing to accept this, and by the way, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, who had a veto power, he had two votes. Think about it. You have six people choosing, and one person has two votes. Where in the Sunnah of the Prophet did you ever see anybody ever set up such a system? It was rigged to ensure that the Khilaf of Imam Ali salam was denied. But what you find is Imam Ali salam says, no problem. Because we as the Imams, whether we are standing, as imams or sitting, as the Prophet said, you have to obey us. We are your leaders. That leadership is very important. If you see the chaos in the world today, the political chaos, the social chaos, and spiritual chaos that we have, where we have apathy in religion, it is the result of bad leadership. Let me give you one quick example. You find that supremacy, people blatantly bringing down black people and says, I hate you today. You know, I'm going to call the cops, the people like Amy Cooper. I'm going to call the cops. You're a black man. I'm a white woman. You know, I'm going to get you arrested. This blatant racism that's coming out, how is this cancer was always there. How is it coming out? It's coming out because we have leaders who say it blatantly today. Bullying. We have leaders who are master bullies. They bully people left, right, and center. So when you bully, what happens with the people? You, you start to see a rise in bullying. You start to see people bullying uh, uh, innocent people, and it starts to become the status quo. It just trickles down. The minute leadership allows it, the minute leadership practices it, whether you and I like it or not, it ends up becoming the system, the status quo. You find our children today are practicing uh, vulgarity, name-calling, bullying. This is not something that's uh, you know, a surprise to us. When you have leadership, calling people names and giving them what we call condescending uh, you know, statements that are very belittling of others. And it's accepted even in Congress and it's accepted in the mass media. Then our children learn that that leadership is teaching us that it's okay to do this. It's okay to be a misogynist. It's okay to put your hands in the wrong place. It's okay to be with extra women though you're married to one. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You and I might think we're shrugging our shoulder. We're living in a democracy. What we don't realize is that that leadership plays a huge role in our behavior problems because it all trickles down. When you have bad leadership, even when we look at the Juneteenth situation where, you know, this freedom that's given, and then you find in Oklahoma, a whole black community is, is destroyed because leadership allows it. You know, the Jim Crow's of the world that we have today, what happens? It all boils down. This conversation about Imam Rada and our Imams is that you and I should hold on to these templates. And when we look at presidents of the world today and look at the presidents of our communities and we look at leadership in our families, we have to follow these protocols by saying, I am going to place all my leaders in my community, in my society, and I'm going to look at them through the lens of these personalities. That's why we're talking about all Imams today. And Imam Radha was not bought. Rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wala bay'un an dhikrillah. Men who are not for sale for any price. And I think that's the, the important part for you and I to discuss in this conversation, inshallah. Brother Muhammad, you're back. So Yes. Can you hear me now better? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Much better. I think our, uh, we have CSIS. You guys have FBI. We know what they do. Anyway, so I wanted to say something before they cut me off have such an important point to make because it it just breaks my heart whenever I hear this story 
and it's about Imam Rida and it's about his son Imam Muhammad Jawad, peace be upon them. And we know we've heard about this, but I just want to say something, and you know I have more things to say, but I just want to say this point first. We know Allah had we go back to where Shaitan was telling uh, Allah that look, I don't want to bow down to Adam, and we know what he said to God is because he felt he was better, right? So Rav Ra verse 12, he says, well, I'm made of fire and he's made of clay, right? And so this was our first example of discrimination, which you call racism. And this has crept through all of the world today. As you can see, Black Lives Matter is so important and so important to, to break the oppression and the negativity. Now, you may say this doesn't happen in our faith. But if you look at the imams, and we've all heard about it, is you go from Imam Jafar Sadiq all the way, at, even to Imam Mahdi's mother, they're from the Africa subcontinent, meaning they're of darker complexion. And so when Imam Muhammad Jawad was told by the, to the people that he will be my successor, and at that time he was only two years old, okay? 25 months old, very young. So people, are, of course, have their doubts. And we're talking about that they didn't even accept Jesus, for example, peace be upon him. And I know another battle where, where the Jews and the Christians and all these other faiths were battling with um, Imam Rida. He made them wake up first to their own problem. Like, like he said to the Jews, you feel that uh, you have Moses. He says, why don't you follow another prophet? He says, well, show us. He says, what about Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam? Oh, no, we never saw him. He says, well, you never saw Moses, so why do you follow him? And they were dumbfounded. And he says, we should love Jesus, I and mean, we should love Prophet Muhammad. And he proved it to them. So he expound and guided humanity back to loving God all in one faith, meaning we're all here together in the same goal. So the discrimination that the imams felt, even by the basis of the color of their skin, is a fact. It's in all history books. And sadly, can you imagine how the imams, what they suffered? So when, uh, you've heard this story, but when people rejected Imam Muhammad Jawad, peace be upon him, and Imam Ali al-Rida called all these famous face, um, I don't know what the word is in English, maybe they call them, uh, uh, what do you call them? Ilme Firasa? Firasa? Uh, okay. physio physiognomy? physiognomy? I think it's physiognomy. Physiognomy, I don't know. Anyway, but it, today they have it, but in those days they had these amazing Ilmul Farsiya people who were able to look at someone's face and tell you who the father was. Mm -hmm. And just by looking at some of the, the, the hair and some of the things. So they put a whole bunch of children and they started looking halfway. And I think, Brother Hassan, you and I learned this like 30 years ago when Moana unrolled these classes when he used to teach us, teach us these stories. When he got to this point, halfway, all the people just collapsed, went on the ground, they, they were like sympathetic because they realized they didn't need to finish the whole group of people. They saw Imam Jawad and they said, this is your son. He is going to be the Imam. And Imam, Muhammad Jawad actually spoke at age two and eloquently, beautifully. But the world was so racist just because of the color of his skin. He was darker of complexion. So we say, oh, no, 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 our, our moms are blonde hair, blue eyes. You know, like, like some people say, Jesus, that doesn't matter. That color doesn't matter. It's, again, the principles, the morals, the ethics. Now, you may say, this doesn't happen anymore, okay? Our Muslims, ah, we are the best because all the different colors of the world are in our faith. And Mount Malcolm X's book is amazing, and he's been strong and shown to the world that, yeah, it's not one color, it's all. We're all brothers and sisters. The Quran even talks about that. However, I want to say this point. When I went to Iraq 10 years ago, we went to see Imam Jawad's beautiful grave in, uh, I guess, Kalbain, and then we had gone to Masjid al-Sahla, and I met one of the most beautiful brothers in my life, a Senegalese, follow of Ahlul Bayt, found God, found Ahlul Bayt, and he knew, if you know Mashallah al Sahar, they have these maqams, and you do these ziyarats, and he knew everything. And he spoke, and he had a French book, and he was showing me, look, I just hung out with him. I said, this guy, this is why I've come. I look for these type of people, these pure souls. So we're going through the point, and in the end, there's a station where they say Imam Mahdi uh, disappeared, or he, he comes, and, and it was closed. And he says, oh my God. And the guy started to cry. He says, I can't believe it. I've come from all the way from Senegal, and I can't even go? 
I said to him, look, pray. You've done this prayers? Pray right now and watch. We go, and this is, I'm not telling a lie. We go to the gate. The gate opens. He says, oh, my God, what's going on here? We go in. It's like a koja party. He said, what's going on in here? And everybody probably paid their ways to get into the gate, got in. Okay, I told his brother, let's go in the back. Let's just do a ziyarat. And we're doing ziyarat, and all of a sudden, a man and a woman come screaming at us. They says, get the hell out of here. Said, Let him finish doing ziyarat of Imam Mahdi. He said, who cares about Imam Mahdi? I said, what? What are you even here for? We're here to worship God and be uh, grateful to our imams. And you're saying, get out of here? I said, I'll give some money to that doorman that you bribed. And he got even more angry. Now, fortunately, I did go back to... You know, back to the North America. I met that guy and I confronted him and I said, what you did was wrong. He apologized profusely, probably because he knew my family. He said, oh, you're from this family? Oh, I know you. Nice, but what about that Senegalese brother who was discriminated against? So it happens. Brothers and sisters, you may say, George Floyd, all, it, these things happen so badly, but we got to make a change. When we the, have to love each other. When the brother apologized, did he explain to you why he did it? What was, the, what was the driving force of why he did it? Well, was it just... Uh, you want to be candid? His wife was screaming at him. So he did it because of his wife. Secondly, I'm sure the pressure and the stress is... Look, when someone is acting crazy, it's not because they're crazy. There's something else bothering yeah. them. So I forgive. I forgive. So I understood that. But at the same time, that one guy felt the, you know, the pain. And that's, that hurts me. What do you mean pressure? Institutional pressure? Individual? No, he's a group. He had a group of 200 people in the Ziyarat, right? So, you know, and then we do camps with sometimes 500 people. So I understand sometimes pressure could be terrible. But that mm -hmm. racism, discrimination, and you say, who cares about Imam Mahdi? That, to me, was terrible. He did apologize. And actually, he did die, after, actually, too. So thank God he did apologize to me. But I, if I, the other brothers in Senegal, and he's watching, I pray that he sees the message that it's, you know, it's forgive and forget, and we got to care for each other. We all make mistakes, and I pray that we change this negativity that we have within us. You know, when brother, it comes from Iblis. yes, you brought about forgiveness, and I think that is another discussion in and of itself. Because if you look at the life of Imam Rida, alayhi salam, one of the things that he manifested truly was this quality of forgiveness, just like all of the Imams. And the beautiful story that I want to share that it really highlights is forgiveness of the Imam. As you know, this historical context we've been providing about how Ma'moon forced Imam to migrate to Ma'ur from Medina, even if we take one step back, the reason, by the way, Ma'moon was trying to use Imam as a political pawn was because he was trying to overcome his own brother, Amin, who the father had left behind two children. And he said, okay, Amin, because as you know, Ma'moon and Amin, by the way, they had two separate mothers. Amin's mother was an Arab. Mahmoud's mother was a Persian. So the father, Harun al-Rashid, says, okay, look, the Persians are going to support Mahmoud because his mother is Persian. The Arabs are going to support Amin because the, his mother is Arab. So he says, Amin, you take care of the Arabian part of the Islamic empire and, and Mahmoud, you take care of the Persian empire. By the way, classic, right? You, talk, you want to talk about racism, people liking their own kind only. This is You had it here. And by the way, classic also, as soon as Harun al-Rashid passes away, you think the two brothers looked at each other and says, oh, we have a deal. Oh, we're going to equally split what our father left behind? No, classic. One brother, Amin, gets up. He says, no, I am the rightful caliph, right? Mm -hmm. Classic human behavior. Father leaves behind money, power, wealth. They, all of this just so that the children can fight over, you know, who gets to control what. Classic human behavior. So, Amin. So there was racism right there. Exactly. Yeah. And Amin says, Amin says, you know what? He enforces himself as the caliph. He says, you know, my father introduced me as a caliph. And he declared himself as the caliph of the entire Islamic empire. And Mamun was always trying to, you know, overcome him. But at the beginning, Amin was successful. And the reason why I bring up this historical context is when Amin was successful in the initial stages and he was the, the ruler over Mamun, they say that Amin sent some of his, you know, henchmen led by a man named, by the name of Jaludi to Medina. And the people of Medina were known to support Mamun. And hence, he went there and he wanted Jaludi and his henchmen to cause chaos in the city of Medina. And one of the houses that they went to was the house of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. And they went to the house of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam and they get to the house, Imam al-Ridha comes out and he confronts Jaludi. He says, look, I know you want my jewelry, the wealth, whatever little I have in my house, I know you want that. But I'll allow you to take all of it and I'm an Imam. I'm a man of God. I will be true to my word. I will not take a single thing out of this house. Just let me bring my family out and then you can go do your looting. You can destroy the house. You can do whatever you want. So he does this. Jaludi goes, destroys the house and, and that's the end of that. But I bring this up to mention the context that years later, 
when now Mamun is the crown prince and Amin has been killed, as you know, Mamun's army eventually overtook Amin, his brother, and now Mamun is the king. And you know, when a new king takes over, he, ga he gathers all the henchmen and the top commanders of the previous king and he puts them in prison. So one of the people that Mamun puts in prison is Jaludi because he was a henchman of his brother Amin. And when he took over, now Jaludi is in prison. And now the, the scene is beautiful. Imam al Rida is now sitting next to Mamun in the court because Mamun has appointed him as the crown prince. And he brings forth Jaludi from prison. So now the scene is there that the Imam is sitting there next to Mamun in the court of Mamun. He's the crown prince. He's the successor of Mamun. He has all the power in the world. And Mamun brings forth Jaludi. And he says, Imam, look, you know who this guy is? He says, yes, I know who he is. The man who destroyed our house. He, you know, he looted our family's wealth, etc., etc." So he says, you know, what should I do with him? And so Imam looks and they say that the Imam whispers into the ears of Mamun that, you know, this man, Jaludi, has now become an elderly figure. He's, he's an old man now. So by my name, I want you to forgive him. And Mamun says, are you sure you want me to forgive him? You know what he's done to your family? He says, yes, I withdraw my right. I want you to forgive him. This is how the Imams write, because Allah says, If you forgive, you pardon, you are forbearant, then surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiving. Meaning, you want God to forgive you? How about you first forgive the grudges you hold with people? But anyways, the Imam says, I forgive him. And now Jaludi is watching the scene of the Imam whispering to Mamun, and he becomes very paranoid because he knows what he's done to the Imam. So he starts screaming out that, Oh Mamun, by the name of your father Harun al-Rashid, I beg you, don't listen to Ali ibn Musa Allah. Don't listen to him. And he's screaming and he's swearing by the name of Harun al-Rashid. So Mamun looks at the Imam and says, you sure you want me to forgive him? He says, yes. But here's Jaludi being so paranoid, you know, having the su dhan. You know, not having husn dhan. He's su dhan. He's screaming, by the name of your father, Harun, don't forgive him. So Mamun says, look, Imam, I respect you, but he's swearing by the life of my father not to listen to you. So I'm not going to listen to you and I'm going to execute him. And this was the story, but the story highlights two important things. One, the forgiveness of the Imam. How no matter what they went through, they were forgiving because at the end of the day, they manifested the attributes of God. The way God is forgiving, they want to be forgiving. And number two, the importance of having, you know, good, good thoughts. You know, husnuddan, they say, is so important. That anytime you see a, someone tells you something about a believer, they say, create 40 excuses in your head. You know, this might not be the case. This might not be the case. Don't have suuddan because suuddan, as you saw in this situation, led, you know, um, Jaludi to being executed. But I thought this was a really important story was to introduce. Was this in the movie uh, Garibatus? Well, yes, I believe it was. Garibatus. Yes, it was. Excellent, excellent, beautiful. I mean, there's I mean, so many other things, things to say. I mean, I mean if, if you if watch... You watch is, am I getting the echo or no? Yeah, I'm getting it. Now it's better. It's a little better now. Yeah. Anyway, I hope Shaitan doesn't stop us. But there's another very beautiful thing I have to say is, Brother Hussain and I, I think my first time to visit Imam Rada was, I think, 26 years ago. With, we went together with a group. And it was, Arba'in, it was so spiritual, amazing. It's, it was a, a, an amazing feeling. And I got to go back 15 years ago. And, you know, I was walking after Fajr and I'm walking and, it's it's so amazing to be at the grave of your imam and just crying and feeling that spirit. It's just beautiful. So I'm leaving after Fajr and I'm in this tranquil feeling. And I see all these young little children selling ziyarat books. I'm sure you've seen it if you go. They, some people beg. Sometimes they sell the, imam, the ziyarat of Imam Rida. And basically they're just saying, they're praying for the imam. Salam like, uh, you know, the imams. And I started talking to them. And they, I said, so what are you guys are doing? So we're just selling these Yarat of Imam. Then they say it in Farsi, which I had somebody with me. We're trying to figure it out. Then I'm talking to two of the boys, and their name is Hassan and Hussein. And I just asked them a question. So is your father okay? And the kids started to cry. I said, oh, man, I know it. It's probably dead. Then I found out they ran away from the Taliban at that time. And they got into Iran. Iran, they got refuge. Beautiful. So this is the beauty of Iran because... You know, all the Imams were buried in Hijaz or in the Arab Peninsula. But Imam Rida was buried in, in the Persia, which changed the dynamic, broke a lot of the racism. Anyway, so I'm talking to these uh, beautiful children. And I'm saying, what do you want? And, oh, I'm on a Fanta. <laughs> okay, soda, an orange soda. We're hanging out. It was, I think, one of my best Yara trips. We just hang, we hung out with all these Afghani children. Beautiful. One time I'm going for ziyarat again for Fajr and I see them and they start following me. I said, okay, alhamdulillah. We get there and they're praying. And I turned around and I realized they're from another school of thought. They close their hands and I said, oh, that's incredibly beautiful. These are all different Muslims praying here. And I asked him, so who is Imam Rida to you? 
And he's again tearing. He says, "This is my mom." I said, "Wow, our own people who follow Al Bayt don't consider that, but these guys loved him." And I found, "Wow." And the, the crazy thing is, you know, if you look at the teachings of Imam Rida, he says, for example, "What do you do with money?" He says, Imam Rida says, one of the most blessed ways to, when you have some money is give to your own family. Number one, family. So I asked all these boys, and we had brought some money from overseas. What could we do for help these kids? And all these refugees and all these kids, they said, oh, we want shoes. And I looked at their feet, and they just had like horrible shoes or what would you call slippers or like, you know, like a soda bottle, like a plastic soda bottle tied with a rubber band. So it was like $3. We bought like 100 pairs of shoes for a bunch of kids. And then I asked these Hassan and Hussein, so what do you want? He says, no, can you do me a favor? Don't buy me shoes. Can you buy our older brother, who's about 16, shoes, so he can get a job? Because he only has one pair of clothes but doesn't have shoes, but they won't hire him because of a pair of shoes. I said, oh my God. You just want shoes and you want it. You follow the imam. You saying give to your family first and you're doing it. I just like cry and I did it. And let me tell you something. I want to see them again, but they gave me something. I don't know. I, I wore this today, but it's way too big. Their father who died gave him a ring. And I said, one day, inshallah, I want to give them that. But this is what the imam wants from us. This kindness that I saw with these orphans. This beautiful living in humanity to care for each other. And this is how we rely on God and live in the way of God. So I hope we can get this beautiful forgiveness and loving teaching, this religion of love that Imam Rada taught us to live. I think it's a beautiful story, Muhammad. What you're, you, you know, you're basically bringing so many factors into, you know, into perspective. One is the traveling and visiting the Imams. Number two, the Imams having such an effect on people, even in foreign lands, who have now become so integral as part of the love of Ahlul Bayt, right? And then secondly, the fact that they're from different schools of thought. Uh, and then the third, of course, many, many more like this, but you have created a network through the Imam because by you visiting and them being there, right, you were able now to bridge between yourselves because of the Imam's love. And I believe the Imams are a, a blessing for humanity, right? Nurun ala nur, light upon light. And whether we talk about the intensity of light or we talk about one light following the next light, the important point to remember is that they become magnets for us that when we go visit them, okay, our spirits get better, our spirituality gets better, our uh, life gets better, our networking expands, our experiences improve, and our ability to fall in love with humanity increases. So they become that bridge that's an incredible power. That's why I always say to people, do ziyarat if you can, especially the Kaaba. Go visit the Kaaba. Go visit the, the Prophet's mosque. It's, it's, it's incredible. You cannot, you cannot explain it. You have to be there. Go visit the graves of these, uh, these personalities because they will affect you. You know, going to Imam Hussein alayhi salam's uh, dari in Karbala, you know, Imam Abbas alayhi salam, for example, and all the companions who are shuhada in Karbala, you will come back, and if it, if it affects you the right way, you will never be the same for the rest of your life. But the moral of the story, why we end here, because we've got a few more minutes left, is the fact that we learn to become loving and forgiving. You know, when Mamun invites uh, guests to come to Imam Rida to, you know, to show off, basically, you find that people bring lots and lots of gifts to Imam Rada. Imam Rada became very wealthy, quote-unquote, right? Because Mamun was trying to buy his way and hopefully to try to corrupt Imam Rada through money. What does Imam Rada alayhi salam do? Incredible. He finds one poor man who was so poor, Imam takes all the gifts and gives it to this one man who was very, very poor, right? So what is the, the moral of the story is that their generosity was second to none. Their power to forgive, as Brother Amil mentioned, just the mere power to forgive a man who destroyed your house and destroyed your wealth. How much vengeance would you and I have? When Allah says, you know, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَلَا يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ You find our Imams were those characters. And I, I want to say this with, with passion. You know, I, I'm seeing that in you, Brother Muhammad, when you're talking, even, you know, uh, Brother Amal, the, the love of Ahl al-Bayt should not be on our lips and on our tongues. It should be in our hands and in our motion and in our thoughts and in our hearts. I think it's very important. When we look at the problems today, many a times I get phone calls, people saying, brother, my children are suffering from depression, suicidal thoughts, families breaking up, you know, 
uh, domestic violence, you, you stack it one behind the other. And often when I'm dealing with these kinds of problems, I'm saying to myself, what would have prevented these problems? And if you really boil it down and you ask any expert, they will tell you that if we have good character with each other, husnul khulq, as they say, khayru rafiq, when you have good uh, demeanor, kindness, love, compassion, we will limit the narcissists. We will limit the evildoers. You know, Brother Ulrich, when Dr. Ulrich, when we interviewed him last week, he mentioned four to five percent of the world's population is made up of these apathetic, in other words, non-empathetic individuals who are narcissistic and self-aggrandized, driven in a Machiavellian way of power and greed, and they have no compassion. Four to five percent. And I even think about that from a mental health point of view or even from a social point of view. Did Allah create a system where four to five percent of the population has to be narcissistic? Or is it the lack of what we are that what we were given, meaning that we were told to obey Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul wa Ulilamani Minkum? And the fact that we've lost that pathway partially, and as a result, that trickle-down evil that comes to us starts to hit our families and our children now start to suffer. And then now we're looking for medication, we're looking for some kind of preventive mechanism or some kind of way to get away from this disease. And I sincerely say this to all of us while we conclude, that said, let's hold on to our salah. Okay, I said, Khui, rahmatullahi alayhi, was asked. A man comes to say Khui in Najaf and says to him that, you know, everything I do doesn't seem to work. I'm a believer in God, but it's not working. Said Khui looked at him and said, how often do you pray? He said, I pray every day. He said, when do you pray? He said, I pray usually before Qadha. Sayyid Khui looked at him and says, you need to change that. That's where your problem lies. Pray on time. Because when you pray on time, by nature, Allah will be your focus. By nature, Allah will become your primary goal. And by nature, you will now act better. And by nature, you will be more patient. And by nature, you will have long-term vision. And by nature, you will be more loving, caring, sharing, giving, and forgiving. Because by nature, when you really look at Allah as your central goal, you start to give out, give out mercy the way Ahl al-Bayt did. Now, of course, it's difficult. Many a times we say it's difficult. When you're praying, you look, you're talking to this absolute being. It's, it's hard to grab on, right? This is why people make idols. This is why Christians have Christ. Because they want to hug a God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with prophets, has blessed us with imams. He says, you don't have to hug me by deifying me with, a, with an idol, but you can hug the ones I sent. You can hug the ones I appointed. I think that's the solution to the problems. So when we go visit these graves, but we maintain prayer, when we read Dua Kumail and we say, ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي وَتَجَرَّعْتُ بِجَهْلِ You know, يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ You know, قَوْوِ عَلَى خِدْمَتِكَ جَوَارِ you know, give me so that I, I do by your authority. Those prayers, when you and I look in the mirror and say, I am a problem, I need to be a solution. And I need to look at these imams who were pulled from their comfort zones. You know, Imam, imam Jafar Sadiq, salam, Mansur Dawaniki, used to drag him while Imam is sleeping. You would, they would, the soldiers would come in the dark of the night, knock down his door, and they would drag him to the palace. Okay, constant. You know, many a times when I get a phone call at 3, 4 in the morning or at 6 in the morning when I'm tired and I feel like, oh, I have to wake up out of my bed. I was thinking the imam used to constantly have that problem. Hmm. And he would go and he would gently listen to what... These are our leaders. These leaders have taught me that tomorrow when you have a problem, don't be dissatisfied. Be patient. There's a greater goal ahead. See, there's a golden, uh, uh, I mean, a silver lining. There's, there's a, you know, there's a golden result in this. The point of the matter is that when you and I suffer and struggle in this world, uh, look at these people as leaders. And in celebration of this living Imam today, Imam, imam Sabu Zaman, his grandfather, Imam Rada, alayhi salam, was moved to a distant land. And look what he did. Today, the nation that is fighting for justice, not only for people of Persia, for people of Iran, it's fighting for justice even in the South in the South African region. When apartheid was prevalent and the world was turning a blind eye to apartheid, a people stood up and said, no, 
We follow the ways of Ahl al-Bayt. And Ahl al-Bayt have taught us that even if you're Christian, even if you're atheist, if there's injustice being done and there's oppression being done on you, then we must rise and fight for that person. For that is the principles of Ahl al-Bayt. The principles that Ahl al-Bayt stood by. And the beauty of our Imams was they were wise. When Mamun would call the sages of the world, Imam Radha would take Christians, Jews, would take Sabians, and he would make them into believers in the court in front of everybody, just by a few sentences. That's the power of our Imams that you and I have been blessed with, and you and I should be doing that, that our words should be filled with wisdom. Our lifestyle should be submissive under those conditions. And I hope you're getting this point, that in this celebration of the Imam, what is important for us is to look at these Imams, just not as Imams, but to say, what did they do in the scenario? How does it apply to me daily? And what can I do to get closer to the ways of Ahlul Bayt through these examples? You know, and you know today, one, yeah, go ahead. Um, one final aspect of the legacy of Imam Radha, and then inshallah we'll conclude, Brother Muhammad, you can make some final comments after this as we end. One final aspect, as we've been mentioning the theme of Imam al and the importance of remembering the Ahlul Bayt and the power of just going and visiting the shrines of Ahlul Bayt is this emotional aspect of the religion of Islam, right? This emotional aspect. And the one important part of the legacy of Imam al Rida was the fact that he really institutionalized the system of majalis that we have today when we commemorate Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He, this is the Imam that really institutionalized and solidified it. Because we know, of course, as soon as Imam Hussein alayhi salam passed away, the ladies, Imam Zain al-Abideen, they held small gatherings. Even Imam Bakr started this tradition, Imam Sadiq. But these were smaller gatherings that were held in their houses and so on and so forth. But Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, they say, was the main central figure that really leveraged his power, not only as an Imam, but the fact that he was made as a crown prince, right? The successor to the Caliph. He leveraged that position to really institutionalize the system of Majalis. And we have this profound, you know, there's so many hadith we have about Imam from Imam al Rida emphasizing the remembrance of Karbala, the remembrance of Ashura, right? They say that anytime Muharram used to come around, he used to tell his companions that in kunta baqi and lishayin, Fabki li Jaddil Hussein, that if you're going to cry over anything, then cry over my grandfather Hussein. And even on this journey, when the Imam was traveling from Medina to Marv, they say one of the areas that he that he stopped in was the area of Qum. And this coincided with the period of Muharram. And Imam established there large public gatherings commemorating Imam al Hussein, commemorating the story of Karbala, because this story of Karbala, this story of Imam Hussein, is not just an emotion for us to cry over. The Imam wasn't just institutionalizing us for us to cry over his grandfather because, you know, Imam Hussein needs our tears. He doesn't need our tears, but he institutionalized a system of majalis because it has the power when you and I take lesson from it. The sacrifice Imam Hussein alayhi salam made, it has the power to revolutionize ourselves, the way we behave. And that's what Imam al did. He institutionalized the system of Majalis. And then when he eventually, when he got into Marv, and he was there as the crown prince of Ma'mun, anytime Muharram would come, he institutionalized and he enforced that people knew now is the time to mourn for the tragedy of Karbala, mourn for the tragedy of Ashura. And he would call, not only would he... First, at first, he would recite the majalis himself and he would narrate to people what happened. But then he would get the likes of Abdullah ibn Thabit, Di'bil al Khuzai, various poets, and he would come and tell them to recite, to narrate to the people the tragedy of Karbala, the event of Ashura, to tell them what happened, to elicit the emotions because the emotions are an important aspect. It's not just a very methodical religion, everything is rational. No, there's an emotional aspect of it. And the emotions are powerful because when we involve our emotions and we connect to the Imam at a heart to heart level and our love for the Imam increases. And when we love someone, when we increase that love, then we will automatically want to be more like them. Oh, Imam, I love you so much and I am so inspired by your sacrifice and the way you sacrificed your family, the way you stood firmly on your principles. You inspire me to do the same. And this is why the Imam al Rila focused so much on institutionalizing the system of majalis, large public gatherings of majalis and remembrance of the tragedy of Karbala. And I thought that was an important point before we concluded to importantly mention that the Imam really, we owe it to him. And just as the other Imams also who started this tradition of remembrance of Ashura, remembrance of Karbala, this was an important aspect of especially Imam al Rila, but also all of the other Imams that they constantly emphasize the remembrance of their grandfather, Imam Hussein and his sacrifice, because it was through his sacrifice 
that the religion of Islam was preserved the way we have it today. But Brother Muhammad, inshallah, you can go ahead and make some final comments as we conclude. Sure. To end, I mean, there's so much Imam Rada left for us for knowledge and, and guidance. And you can say, well, Prophet Isa alayhi salam, he cured the blind, he cured the ill by God's permission. But what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all the Ahlul Bayt taught us is they taught humanity to care for each other back to health. So the science to make people healthy. Now we're living in COVID times where it's so important as, you know, to get cured and to get away from this illness and this plague. And, you know, as Brother Sen has given the story of Ibn Sina when he gave the idea of quarantine, where you just keep people away from other people so it's good. A lot of this stuff is from the teachings of Allah unto us. The Golden Treaties, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard about it, is another uh, you know, piece of material ascribed to the Imam. But going to the end, we do need to have trust in God, love of God, you know, going back to Him. So I'm going to give a little bit of a sentence. He, someone asked the Imam, chapter 65, verse 3, uh, this part that says, alallai fahu hasbuhu. What does that mean? You know, can you explain what it, what it means to whoever relies on Allah that Allah is sufficient? So Imam Rada replies, peace be upon him, he says, reliance is of various degrees, okay? That we know. As we as human beings, as Muslims, as believers of God, of all different faiths, the way we trust in God is very different. Sometimes we say, yeah, yeah, we trust it, but, you know, let me try something else. Uh, Imam Rada says, one part of this uh, uh, answer is one of which is that they rely on Allah with everything related to you and when he does does something that maybe you don't 100 percent agree with you rely on his wisdom and says you know what nevertheless i'm trusting in god you know i may not want this right now but i'm trusting in god second part he says another you believe in the unseen regarding allah of which you have no knowledge and you rely on him and his custodians trusting in him and in with regard with others. So you just have total trust in the unseen in, in God. Now, I'm going to say something funny. I've been trying to do something. My father passed away seven months ago. And I've been trying to help him. And it was funny. For 10 years, I've been trying to help him. After he dies, seven months later, I got a call today. And he says, you know what? We're going to help you. I says, what? I've been trusting in God all these years. And alhamdulillah, things are working out. And God knows when is the best time. But if I, if I gave up hope, I said, forget this. I don't want to do this anymore. It would have been it would have lost. It would have been a loss to me. I could see that. So Alhamdulillah, by us trusting in God and having hope in Him and having loving Him, you think He would abandon us? Never. He's always with us. Okay. I always say there's three things. Wait, maybe, sometimes patience will give you something better. Or what you ask for, He'll give it to you, you know, at a later time. Or He'll give it to you. But He's going to give it to you. He's going to give you what's best. And that's the trust in Him that, you know, we've always seen that with everything we've done, with camps, everything. This media, everything, he's been taking care of everything. And that, hopefully, we can trust in God in all our lives and love him as much. May Allah bless you, Mama. Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Inshallah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll conclude on this and continue this discussion on the legacy of Imam Rada salam tomorrow from a different dimension, uh, especially when it comes to the issues of, uh, of migration and hijrat and, you know, forced migrations versus willful migration and today we have refugee systems you know that are taking there are playing a huge role in the future of our communities and we need to sort of uh, you know uh, take that into consideration how to deal with all of that uh, inshallah yeah inshallah on that note we will wrap up thank you brother muhammad for joining us uh, thank you as always to all of our viewers for your continuous participation may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all inshallah we'll see you in the upcoming programs. Wassalamu alaikum. Jamia'u wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, we'll end with a short dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana aghfir lana wa li ikhwanina al-lazina sabakuna bil-iman wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan lil-lazina amanu Rabbana innaka ra'uf ar-Rahim wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina muhammadin wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma.